All right, just waiting for a couple of people to show up from France. How's it going? It's good to see you again. Welcome back. Um, sure, we're gonna work on today. Feel a little sassy. Wanna have a little fun? I was thinking maybe we do like a little text adventure or something like that, text adventure game or something like that. Just for fun. Um, there's also a couple other projects I commit to, just to switch it up. Yeah. Uh, get that. Oh, what's it called? JSON Autotype. Recently had a PR merged here. It's awesome. Uh, except they, I think they're on you know, something else now. But it's called the text adventure. I've just been thinking about it a lot lately. I was reading some fun stuff uh, about from Quayenic. Quay? Quayenic? Ugh, can't find the website. I'm not even saying kawaii, kawaii, kawaii. Something like that, ah. Ah, what was it? It was in the FP chat, it was up there. I'll find it there, don't worry. But uh, I saw a cool little post from them on, on a bunch of stuff, but I like. Uh, it was on like type safety and like little Haskell mini Haskell patterns like smart constructors and stuff uh, which is pretty useful stuff to know uh, and text adventures are just something I've been thinking about lately just because like I used to play them and uh, it's something I've used as kind of an example program for introducing Haskell sometimes because it's pretty easy to understand, simple to model. Yeah, little little mini pan patterns here. So this is a pretty cool um, little page they put together. It's very helpful. New type pattern. Use that a lot. Uh, smart constructors. We use that a lot. evidence. This one, I don't know if it's a pattern, but it's a good thing to do. Um, basically overcoming this blue and blindness thing. I kind of post a bunch of things on it too. So not throwing away information if you can when you're pattern matching on stuff or um, composing things together. There's also making illegal states rep Unrepresentable. There's lots of ways to do this in Haskell, of course. Um, they have some pretty good suggestions on on some stuff, which I think is pretty good. Uh, phantom type parameters, also nice. This one, like, I don't know. I encountered phantom type parameters pretty early on, and I saw talks on it. I guess I didn't really got it until this makes it pretty simple actually i don't know why it was so foreign but i don't know monad fail sugar so using do notation where it's more convenient because uh yeah shorts this is monad fails kind of built into some of the do notation stuff so it's pretty handy writing short brief code that's pretty easy to read this is a new one i haven't heard this one before polymorphization assigning a more general type to a function reduces the chance of writing an incorrect implementation so i just haven't heard people call it polymorphization um, but it's like the idea that you should write your functions as polymorphically as you can um, try not to use 
specific uh, types where you can, because basically the idea is that uh, in order to say anything about that A or that B, you have to put a constraint on it, otherwise you can't really do much with it. You can't test it for a quality, unless you have an equality constraint, right? Um, that's, pr that's a pretty useful thing to have, but it's not immediately apparent, I think. Uh, especially to newcomers. Like, I've tried teaching Haskell to a group at work, and uh, that kind of type parameter stuff kind of messes with people's minds. However, uh, it, once it sinks in, it's like, oh, okay, cool, right? Like, make it as polymorphic as you can, and then you add your type, your little class constraints on there, and then you can say, okay, well, you know, I can only compare the A's for equality, right? And that means that I'm only going to do this with this. Or if I do something with lists and I put an ORD constraint on the elements, that means I'm going to be ordering them or comparing them somehow. Right? That's sorting them, reversing them. But that's the only things that it can, it can do. Right? So I think that's where polymorphization kind of like really makes code kind of readable too. Um, this one's interesting. I don't know. Bidirectional parsing. So match only a limited set with exhaustiveness checking and inverse matching function automatically. Well, that's kind of cool. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's good stuff too. Um, Always good to have bidirectional parsing for things like that. Recursive Go. Moving recursion over data types into a sep separate function. When recursion uses some arguments and you want to avoid passing them again. When recursion uses some internal state to avoid revalidating the same data. <laughs> I like the disclaimer. <laughs> Oh, cool. This is some, I've never really, I don't think I've seen that one before. That's kind of not. Or maybe I've just seen it in a different way. Hmm. Another interesting, well, it's not a mini pattern, but uh, that's also kind of handy once you get to know it is the recursion scheme type stuff. It's got a bunch of funky names, it's super dense, but it's like a lot of things in Haskell. Once you once you break through on the other side, it's all good. Anyways, I thought that was a cool post, so worth checking out. Haskell mini patterns from Kowainik. That's why I couldn't find it. So they put out a lot of good stuff and some interesting libraries and things like that. So check them out. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think I'm gonna check. I'm gonna switch it up today. I'm gonna switch it up today from the from Rosby from the database. Well, let's let's just mess around. Right? Let's make a let's make a text adventure game engine type thing. Um, I got my editor changed up a little bit. I'm now running my editor Emacs through an X server on Windows. So this is actually Emacs in WSL2 running under Linux, so it should be a lot faster now, uh, which is why I wanted to, to get that going. Might mean that I also may have to rebuild GHC IDE for my projects, maybe. Oh, but nice and speedy. Look at that, oh, so good. All right. Uh, Let's do, what should we call our little adventure engine? Storyfy. That sounds very web. Probably already exists. Uh, I wish there was some clever literary thing I could think of right now. Hmm. Let's just call it adventure engine. Why not? Uh, I probably need a new... 
Oh, 2.3.3 is available. Yay. So I hope you've had a good week. I hope that you had a good weekend. Mine's been pretty good so far. I went to a skate park for the first, pretty much the first time in my life. Well, technically second time. I was in a skate park once when I was a teenager in the 90s. But I didn't skate. I wasn't a skater. But I went, I went yesterday on the weekend, or not yesterday, I guess today's Tuesday. I went on the weekend, um, took the kids, and had a good time. I've been working on that this summer. Uh, just wanted to teach my kids that uh, you, know, you can learn stuff just by not being good at it at first, <laughs> being kind of shy at it at first, and then you know practicing and getting better just by doing it a little bit each day. Um, so, you know, I started off just putting around and like I've always had a skateboard, so I like knew how to like push and light on it. But working on them ollies and pop shabbats and spinning around and, and it was fun. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. So I'm gonna add just a couple of libraries here. Probably gonna need containers. Almost always text because it's a text adventure engine. Uh, I don't know if we'll need anything more than that for now. Gotta fill in the important stuff. Who wrote this? Send me an angry email about how terrible it is and the features you need to make it better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, I guess we'll just kind of like compile it now. And just make sure that it all builds and everything's good steady. What do you mean, stacking it? Fine. Good. I didn't think so. What's happening? What's even happening here? Oh, I didn't mean to be stacking it. What's going on with this? Hi. Uh oh. Stack? Stackage down? Let's check what's going on with this. No way. Sometimes due to missing certificate authorities on your system. Okay. Uh, am I missing a stack.yaml file? Oh, no, maybe. You know what? That's not working right. Let's uh, just start over again since we're not very far in. setting up the project is kind of something, something. Maybe it's this. And let's see if it's that. That's weird. 
But these things happen sometimes. Yeah, this isn't Windows. Maybe just try. Update in here. No, it's just not happening. What's going on? Friends? The infrastructure is falling apart. <laughs> With everything else, it must be COVID. Am I even streaming right now? It's me? No. Stackage just down? Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> Askel friends, what's going on? <laughs> Alternatives. Now that we're running in Linux. We can run GHC up to get kind of a Haskell platform. I don't like that though. That's not fun. Be something going on here. Mm -mm. It's no fun. I want to be writing code here, not messing around with this stuff. I even paying anything from here. Might have been something I messed up here. It must be. down. Some of it looks up. The yeah, hot X are up. Well, that's very surprising. I was not expecting that tonight. Um, but my other problem here is that uh, I'm not getting anything. That might be my firewall settings. I might be a little bit too strict on this next server thing. would be bad. Ah. All right. Uh, maybe. 
maybe we go back to the old stuff. Uh, bam. Well, you know what? If we don't get it, we don't get it. For now, it's fine. We can do stuff without it. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to compile anything manually. That's weird. I don't like it. Okay. Anyway, uh, can, can you see this? Is this font big enough on the stream? Maybe a little bigger. Might end up having to do this for every buffer, so let's just try and stick to this one for now. Okay. So. Let's talk adventure games for a minute, right? Text adventure games are basically like trying to model some imaginary version of reality. And the nice thing about them is that uh, we don't have to simulate everything. Um, and a lot is left, it can be left to the imagination. So we can make, we can make you can make things you can do a lot more clever things than you could do in physical games. Um, you can do very simple things. It depends on how deep you want to get. Uh, but they're pretty easy to model. Kind of the a lot of the standard ways for modeling a world that you would use in a text adventure are built on these ideas of like rooms and the player, obviously. Um, items, uh, exits that go between rooms that make up a map of the world. And you might have other entities in the world, like maybe characters. And they kind of all interact with the user through text. Right, the user can type in kind of a little sentence, like pick up the foo, pick up the bar, the crowbar, and then you send that to computer, and the computer parses it and says, "Oh, I understand what that what you mean," and then they perform the action for the user and change the state of the world. Right? They pick up the crowbar from the room if it's present. Right? If the, that item isn't there, then what can it do? Right? So. Uh, let's just model a room. And it's kind of like our basic space where we're going to occupy things. And that's where we're going to get like a room name. And we'll have a description. That'll be kind of like what the user sees in the room. Uh, we can have... Uh, what else would be in the room? Items items that are there. Uh, we're going to have to define what an item is. And we're going to need maybe room characters or room NPCs. Entities. I don't know if we want to be that abstract. Characters. Uh, let's just limit the scope on this one just for funsies because I don't know if we want to go too far with this project. It's just to mess around. Uh, and exits, I guess, would be maybe another one. Not sure if we'll need this one. Alright. Grab some basic stock stuff as you do. If you can. So let's define an item. That's going to be pretty simple as well, I think. Just a bag of properties. Item name. Item, item description. Um, 
Maybe can have, item can have other properties to it too, like size, weight. It's really up to us what we want to simulate. Come on, it's kind of bad to start a design for a game without really like knowing much about the game and what you're trying to build. I guess. <laughs> But we're just we're just we're just having a little fun. We're just throwing some stuff together. I think it'll be good enough if we can like get the character in the room and give it a few commands and move around a bit and pick up items, and stuff. And see, just see where it goes. Uh, so what else do we need? An exit. So the exit. Uh, we'll have a description, a name. And a description, just like everything else does. So far, anyway. And... Probably a from... Uh, and an exit too. Now I'm noticing something already here. Um, when we do this. is like we're not really going to put a value of a room in here but we want to refer to a room so we need some way to reference other things just refer to them by some kind of id so i'm going to borrow a pattern from that kawaii nick post on many haskell patterns I'm going to find something called an entity ID. Put a little type parameter in the front. But I'm not going to use the type parameter. Actually, I'll make it a new type. I'll put the actual entity ID there. I don't think we need any other instances for Entity ID right now. But what this will let us do now is that instead of having the actual item values sitting in the room, we just have a list of the Entity IDs for that item. And see the exits. Which We'll get back to that in a second. So we've got exits, items, rooms. Uh, but to tie this stuff together into a world, we need, a world is kind of like the state, a state, right? It's constantly changing depending on what the user is doing and the rules of the game. Uh, what's permissible and what's not and, and that kind of stuff. So the world is kind of be, Feel kind of like a database of all the things that are in it. Um, we also need a type, I think, for the idea of a map, like what rooms and what exits connect to each other. Maybe. Should have like a template for this. So I'm typing up by hand like a. White color barbarian. I don't know. Um, yeah. So basically, that, like our database could be just world rooms, right? It could be a map. This is kind of why I wanted the the containers package here. Um, so I wanted a map of entity ID for room and room. For now, until stackage comes back, we could probably get away with this and just do an association map. Uh, so the world rooms, the world items, same thing. I like it. I love it. It's awesome. Exits. 
Right, 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 right. So what does this mean? What is what can we do with this now, right? How do we connect it all together? Well, I don't know if we really need to know about Actually, yeah, that's fine. This is good. So what I'm thinking is does the exit really need to know what room it connects to. Or should it just be a name and a description? Because um, I want some kind of way of building up the map of the world together into a data structure so that... Yeah, maybe we don't even really need to know. Because we have the map of say rooms and the current player position that's what we need to do too um, player room All right we could have a function that looks at the room for, say, displaying what I'm currently seeing. Um, that takes the player room's current identity, the current place that I'm in, looks up the room's description from our little database here, and displays it. And it also displays the exits. And then if I want to travel from one room to another, I can look up the current room based on the current player's room, where their current state, the state is, where they are. I can pull out the exit and do the check there. I think that's going to work just fine. It seems like a thing you can do. I don't have to look into the room object necessarily to look into what exits are available. I think the room only needs a list of exit identities so it knows it can go into the database when we're rendering the room to render the list of exits that are available. Same with items. So they're kind of disconnected-ish, but connected through reference. That way. That's pretty cool. So let's, uh, I don't know, let's render, let's come up with a, a, a room. And uh, let's give it a name. What should we set our setting? I don't know. I'm not. Hmm. Let's say the front porch of the front porch. It's ominous and mysterious, right? There's a faded white picket fence in the yard. And an old swing next to you. Sounds good. Okay, and then what else do we need? We need the list of items and list of exits. Let's just put empty lists in there for now. Because um, I just want to get to, like, say, render the room. Or we could even go render the whole scene. But we take a room. We're just gonna go on end up with a string. We'll pull out the different parts. Just the description 
the name in the description. For now, ignore the other bits. Name. Put a little medium dash over there. Oh, no, we'll need the name and a new line. And then put a new line here. Description. That's it. Except you're I'm mm, good to go. Cool. Let's check it out. Uh, can we get can we get a Haskell buffer? All oh, right, good rep on here. Awesome. Do I have rendered room already loaded? I do. Okay. So let's render our default room. Cool, cool, cool. And if we print that out properly to a console, we get a nice display there. There's a faded white picket fence in the yard. And an old swing next to you. Sounds nice. Okay, not creepy at all. Alright, so what else could we do? We could add an item here. We could render that as well, I suppose. Ah, and this is where we run into it. Thank you, friend. Yes, I could use onlines. <laughs> Sometimes I just hack it together super dirty. So unlines, just like that. Takes a list of strings, gives you a string. And we can toss our Put our name, our dashes, and the description. Mm, much nicer, thank you. Doesn't look quite as ugly. <laughs> uh, here's here's the trick though now, because uh, rendering room when you have just room is, is fine, but the room itself only has references. Um, so our render room function actually needs like the whole world so that it can go and look up um, the items and get their descriptions as well. Um, so let's give it a world and do we want to give it the room ID? Yeah, maybe the only ID of the room. The room we want to render. That seems to make sense. And then we need a we need to construct a default world. So let's go do that now. World, hello. Hello world, so nice to meet you. So small and beautiful in the beginning, and just tiny. We'll put our room in here. We probably need to borrow another um, mini pattern from that wonderful, wonderful blog post uh, for constructing entity IDs. However, for now, let's just do it by hand and we'll, we'll fix that up later. And we need an entity ID of the current room. So let's just say we're in, in one. Cool. So this doesn't make sense anymore. So let's just get rid of that. 
Render room. the items probably in the exits uh, we're gonna just ignore the players current position right now and just take the room ID cool so basically what we have here now is uh, a way we have See the rooms database and scope, so we need to pull out the room that we're looking for. Uh, from that, and there's an, a lookup function in data.list for that. Unfortunately, it doesn't have any other helper functions for working with association lists built in, so we go too much further. We may end up having to either write them or hope that stack is just back online and we can actually put proper maps in here. Um, so I think it's just called lookup, if I'm not mistaken. And the type of that is, hopefully you can see that in the status line. Uh, it takes the A, the association list, and, uh, and double pairs. So we have equality, so we should be able to just give it the room ID. Uh, and actually, we don't need to unwrap the room ID because we don't need the inner integer. We should just be able to do it up like this. And then we have the room. So now we can, uh, we can kind of construct our string from there. Yeah, oh, well. Yeah, we're gonna do it from there because we're gonna add items. We'll do that in a second. So let's just go back and reconstruct what we had before. Why don't I just modify it? I don't know. But anyways, super fast. Quick as lightning coding here. Tiga tiga tiga. Uh, yeah, description, onlines. Pull it off to the left. I'm kind of a pull it off to the left kind of person. Uh, no, name. They wanted name. Your name. And room description. Super simple, super fancy. Doesn't like this though because. Oh, it's a maybe. Of course, of course. So there's always the possibility that the room might not be in our map, which we're forced to deal with here. Hmm. Well, if we go to look up a room that doesn't exist, it's probably, it's probably a problem. Invalid or missing room. And that'll be entering the ID of a room. Uh, and that needs to be an equal sign, of course. Just getting ahead of myself here. Now, I'm not sure if I'm going to like this very much, because now I'm dirtying things up here with this. I like what we had before, so it's nice and pure. I think what we should have, 
instead of rendering a room from the world like this, is that we should force the user to go look that stuff up for us and give us the things we need in order to render a room properly out of the database. Seems like a reasonable thing to do. And that way we don't have this either stuff that can be handled um, maybe in a place where that'll be better handled. Like when we're loading the database of rooms and exits and items and stuff. Yeah, I like what we had before, so let's let's back out of this. It's getting messy. This was nice. This was nice. This worked. There was nothing wrong with it. We just needed more information. We can't have just the room. Because we also have to look up stuff based on all the things. So you gotta give us the room, the list of items, and the list of exits. You go look that up give it to this function and then we'll we'll talk then I can rent your stuff I can rent, I can give you a stream so this feels a little maybe a little nicer now we don't have to worry about a lot of other stuff so when it comes to this now we can just get the items the exits Uh, we might not even use the exits for now. Let's just get to items. Um, let's give our item uh, two. And we'll just we'll just pretend we go look that up. Um, let's just render what the items would look like. So we could put like a little dash down here, kind of like we had it before. And we could have another line, it's like, you see. Uh, then we could concatenate that with, oh, what was it? Intercalate with, Uh, just item names, that's right. To Calite. And... Item... That seems cromulent. Let's reload it. All right, so I got a red room. I also have to give it a list of items. So let's just say there's a shovel. It's rusty and painted. And I think that's all we have to give you to construct you. Size and weight. It's an imaginary size three, an imaginary weight five. Uh, we'll give you an empty list for something else. Cool. That feels a little nicer. Uh, 
And if we add a second one, of course, we'll get that nice common separated list. So we'll see a shovel, a purse. It's hidden in, in a corner under some leaves. It's got only got a weight of um, one. That seems nice. A yeah, nice pure function. Render room. I like it. That's good. Okay. Uh, exits. All right. Let's see. I'm gonna just add another one here. So we can highlight that later. And we do the same thing for exits. Possible exits. And we'll just get the exit now. And then, of course, well, front door. It's big and foreboding. Double French. I don't know what that means. It's just big and foreboding. We're going for, I guess, a horror story here or something. Uh, from and to. Okay, so we need an entity ID for room. Probably have to wrap that in parentheses. Cool. So we can render the front door. We can look at it. That's cool. Alright, so that, that was like... I think that's a pretty good design. So that means like when we render a room, whoever re calls this function is going to have to do all the lookups and deal with all the possible errors of things not being right. But rendering a room should be a nice pure function with no bifurcation or anything like that. Cool. Um, so entity IDs. Do we need to touch the smart constructors yet? Uh, I don't think so. Where else can we go from here? We want to render the room. We've done that part. Let's see. We could get to picking out together, picking out the rooms of the, from the database so we can call render room. Hmm. I don't know if I want to jump right into the game state now. <laughs> hmm. Let's just check if Stackage is back up here quickly. I haven't fixed that at all, so that's kind of worked. Thanks, friend, top BWF. I don't even know how to pronounce that. <laughs> uh, it's been on fire for a week now, that's too bad. Apparently my computer's on fire too and I need to, to fix that as well. I don't know, I added some kind of like X server in Windows here and some firewall rules to get it to work. And I think I might have messed up those firewall rules, because I can't get out of here at all, to the net. 
We're stuck in our little textual cell. Okay, cool. Okay, so I'm, I can render the room. Let's be... We're gonna have to deal with the world state here somehow. So let's do that, I guess. And we'll kind of see if we can't move from one room to another, because that would be pretty cool. So what is the world state? And how do we want to model this? Like, we could come up with a kind of pureish function, right? Um, managing the world. Um, so we could, like, have, like, a... I don't... A lot of text games almost operate like a REPL. Right, you input some commands here, you press enter, the REPL tells you no, yes, whatever. Hey Beavich, how you doing? I need some better overlays. Um, so today we're kind of mixing it up a little bit and just working on a text adventure engine game thing. Just kind of slapping together some stuff. And just chilling, chilling, acting all cool, coding some Haskell outside of school, drinking my juice. Unfortunately, no gin. So uh, basically, yeah, it kind of looks works like a REPL, like a read eval print loop. Is one way it could do it. We could also have like timed events and you know, we could have the characters be able to move around in our simulation and things like that. That would be pretty cool too. And so we might not, we might want like a tick kind of thing and do a whole, do a whole thing like that. So one way you could do it, you could have like a, some kind of command type. Right? You could make a world command, and the goal, our goal here is to produce a new version of that world. Right? And our command could be uh, we could have like a prefix preset list of commands like these are the only ones we understand I mean, yeah, like block and we could be like we have to give it a uh, room ID that's that's kind of the only one we want to really talk about right now uh, before we get ahead of ourselves and this is this is pretty simple. Yeah, I know we could use a new type, thanks. Ignore that for now. So we could probably add other commands. Yeah, Bivich just started kind of whipping through this. Uh, I sometimes use text adventure engines of a very limited scope in like when I'm live coding and demonstrating Haskell. Uh, and I've been thinking about it a little bit today. If you go back and, and watch the stream on YouTube in the first hour, uh, I was showing off a cool blog post from Kawainik about just little mini Haskell patterns. Haskell mini patterns. So we're trying to keep some of those in mind today as we work on this. Um, just have some, some fun. Heck, we could probably just do a couple of these exercises um, just to the one we've used so far, like new type, uh, we've used 
phantom types. And uh, I guess a little bit of evidence slash make illegal states unrepresentable. Uh, so we did a little bit of that with a render room. We almost went into this place where like, let's pass it the room and a room ID and give a string back. And I quickly realized that looking up into the world to get the room from the room ID means we have an error case we have to handle, which means we got a surface and a room. So we avoided all that pain there. We're forcing someone else to deal with all the lookups and the possibility of failure. And we're talking about that kind of right now, actually. So we have walk, and we could hypothetically have some other command like pick up. Right, that could be an entity ID of a item. Not a room, you can't pick up a room, so um, that makes no sense, right? So that's where I find like that pattern of phantom types is super useful. Right, we could have a generic entity ID new type, but just sticking that little A in there, even though we don't use that value, just sticking the type in there. It's giving us so much awesome stuff right here. It's so good. Already we've made sure that when we parse these commands and do it, we can't talk about picking up rooms or picking up exits. We might want to be able to do that and so we can be more specific and add a command for that, like some kind of admin command if we want to make it's like a multiplayer kind of text adventure thing, like a mud. That could be cool. Uh, but interacting with the world now, if we just have it like this, it's kind of a very big function to me. Right. Uh, we might even put the command first so that we can pattern match it on it off the bat. Oh no, I think the other one is good. Let's just see where this kind of goes and leads and see if we like it. Alright, so we have walk. Room ID. We have a case here and we have pick up item ID. Here. Uh, we need to enable the Lambda case. Yeah, don't mind me, I don't have IDE support right now. Normally I would just click and bring and add that. But... Alright, so then our, our obligation in these holes is to produce an entirely new world. So what do we do when we walk? Maybe this is the function. Like it's a pure function here. So if we have an error, like we can't walk from one room to another because an exit blocks us, or we can't pick up an item because it doesn't exist in the room we're currently in. Um, that means we can't just have a pure world here unless we kind of make, I don't want to put too much power into world, but uh, we could also maybe put like some sort of error state in here, but we could also model that as like, maybe, or either, um, I don't know, game error, or world kind of thing. Kind of what we're kind of doing with render room, only I think this because this is such a big function, it kind of deserves that. There's a lot of things that can happen in here. If you know what I mean. But this game error, I feel like, is going to be a very large enumeration of all the possible things. Just kind of get my spider senses going already. Right? Because, like, for walking, for example, there could be, like, room doesn't exist. Uh, 
There could be... Excuse me. Um, item does not exist. And... That's okay. So now, if we use the do notation, we fail to do something, we just return a game error. Uh, and otherwise, we try to construct the next state of the world, I guess. So depending on where the world you the player is, is the room that we're starting from. So we'll go get that. Now look up, I think returns a maybe. Yeah, we need so we need the world rooms as well. Type of room. Okay, cool. Then we need to get the exits that we're going to. Oh no, yeah, it wouldn't be the room ID. Uh, the command walk. There's an exit you got to go through. In our game, you might want things to happen with things. Maybe the door is locked and you got to find the key first. Or something like that. Right? So that's why we have exits. Um, so let's go make sure it fix that. That shouldn't be a room. That should be an exit. So we go get the exit from the room that we're in uh, based on the exit ID. Or no, from the world. And the exit ID knows about. The world exits. Uh, yeah. So here we go get the room there, we get the exit. Then uh, we need. Now that we have the exit, we can say what room we can, we know the room from. We could actually check if that's a valid room. It could be an invalid room. Exit ID you've given us in the command. And uh, the room that we're going to. All right, and then we can look up that room, make sure it's actually there, and we can update the game state. And if that's a valid room, then we can move the player to that room ID. And that's all we do when we do the update here. So that's all we can do, I think. Cool. So, uh, we can have the exit. Uh, let's just. Uh, room from. Hmm. Let's just check if it's. Uh, what is a valid room? A valid room is the one that we're currently in. So, let's look it up in the database. That'll be the um, exit from or the exit in the world rooms status. Mm. 
And we need the room two. things we need to say the valid room that we're coming from is is cool the world the room we're going to it actually exists and then we can move there's probably going to be more to it in a real game like we're going to have you know, to dynamically dispatch to some kind of code to handle like locked doors and being able to interact with them. But we're just chilling. We're just chilling. We're having fun. Um, what I'm hoping to see from this actually in the kind of the back of my mind is another little pattern, mini pattern, which is this one here. No, I can type parameters. The monad fail sugar. Wow. Okay. We're doing pattern matching, potentially on a lot of different commands. And the particular failure reason here is not super important. Um, it would be a failure of data basically like if this wasn't if somehow we were not constructing the world database properly and this user was able to issue a command to enter a room that doesn't exist shouldn't theoretically happen but so it's not hugely important uh, yeah so the idea with this is that uh, the failure case in do blocks is kind of wrapped a little bit, I guess, in monad with monad fail as part of the desugaring. Um, and there's a couple examples here. Uh, so. What I'm kind of curious though is why I'm not getting any failures with the, uh, the stuff. Because I think lookup returns a maybe. Yeah. That's. That should be a type error, I think. Um, so there might be like some way to convert that maybe to uh, an either of our game either type. And kind of wrap this lookup kind of thing. So we could put this in let bindings instead. Right. Um, but then what we're gonna get here is that we're gonna have to like check. Alright. And then we're gonna have to say like if is nothing exit then this error uh, like return left exit does not exist Um, 
And then we have it else. And then we'd have to check our validation, like is room from. And already I'm kind of getting annoyed and super early in here because I suppose I'm not sure we have a function called is nothing, but it's just pretending. Right, if room from is nothing, that would also be a problem. Then return left. Room does not exist. I don't know. It's supposed to be like a room from whatever. And then we have an else block for that. And you can kind of see where this is going. So, we could turn those maybes back into either's again. Um, we can make a way of them sit there, I don't know, let's say like isomorphic. Um, be like an either or something. It's probably like a. Oh no! What is it? What is it? What is it? Maybe A, or maybe A to either. No. Maybe A, or B, or neither. Maybe. There we go. Data either combinators. Well, it's in a package. Dang. All right, so it's not really. I just want to convert it to. Maybe we might have to just write this ourselves because we can't download stuff right now. <laughs> right. That's maybe two left. Maybe just steal the source of this. Let's get rid of all that junk. Let's get back to where we were. All right, so we go exit and using our maybe to left, we give it the error that it would be. So like, uh, in this case, exit does not exist. And the exit ID. And then we pass that our lookup into the uh, world exits out there. Cool. Now, if that fails, think hopefully uh, we don't have to like have all those if else's everywhere will just fail there. Right? 
Uh, so we got the exit. We get the room from. We do this as well. No, the room does not exist. Yeah, that would be. We need an entity ID room for that. Uh, that's the exit from of the exit. And we pass that to look up. So we're, we're getting a little bit of repetition, but it's not so bad. It's pretty formulaic. So we can that means we can clean it up later by just moving things around. And the world rooms. Oh, world. No, that's not world exists. It's world exits. And then. Similarly, room two. Except two. Right, look up. Exit. I'm always going to type exist, I don't know why. <laughs> it's just how I roll. So we've got the from, the two, based on the exit. Uh, so there's a couple of things that could go wrong here. Uh, we've already established that the room from exists, but if it's not the same as the room the user's currently in in the world, that would be kind of a bug. Uh, I don't know what that error would be. Users in space, trying to avoid space and time. I'm trying to slip through the cracks. So we could, right, we could have a couple little if statements here for that. I think there might be a better way of doing this, but let's just try that for now. Um, so if. That's going to be a room. If it's a right, not the ID. So, yeah, we're checking the exit from here of the exit. Uh, does not equal the player. Was it the world player? World position? Player room. And that's also a problem. Return left. Of, let's make it a space time error. Space wizard. Space wizard error. <laughs> there you go. They're trying to slip through the cracks. You're not allowed, player. Nice try, though. My Haskell has caught you. Oh, I've got some weird person issues here, of course. Space Wizard, game error. And... If the... Otherwise, uh, what do we got? The room two does has to exist. So we can totally walk there. So let's just update the world. Uh, we called it the player room, right? Uh, and that's going to be equal to the exit two of the exit. Okay, 
few issues popping up here. Probably because of bad meaning things that I've forgotten the names to because I have the memory of a goldfish sometimes. Okay, so let's go to the first one. Maybe to the left here. Well, I'm probably messing this up a little bit, aren't I then? Uh, it's saying here that we couldn't match the type exit with game error. I expected either game error, game error, but we're getting either exit error or game error. Oops. It's not doing what I thought it was <laughs> supposed to do. Or I thought it was doing, maybe to the left. What am I doing here? Maybe A. So the maybe returns. Right, we want maybe to write. I want the opposite of that. My bad. So let's clean that up. Oh, I don't have that set up here. Oh, darn. Sorry, new, slightly new Emacs. I haven't transferred over all my configs and stuff yet, so we're <laughs> gonna have to edit this by by just doing a swap and find a replace here. Place pressure strip. Maybe to the left with maybe to the right. Does that satisfy you? This one is not happening. Because... Expected type will Oh, ha, da 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 da. Supposed to pass the world in there. Of course. I was, it's a waste to clean that up. I don't, like, I don't like this record syntax too much. It's not too bad in the small. Uh, and we only have one left. Well, let's not turn in spots. It's my fault because. So it's happy there. Um, okay, so I mean, like, looking at this, it's not... I don't know. We've, we've prevented the code from kind of walking off to the right, which is fine, by using this pattern here. This sort of mini pattern that Koinik is talking about, where we kind of use the add failness to uh, raise the surface our error for us. All right, so if the the exit isn't there, this will return the exit does not exist. Right, if the room isn't there, so on and so forth. Uh, we just have to remember that when we're using this and and do, of course, we're doing this inside the either the either monads. So these all have to be the other type, which is why I had to do this kind of transformation uh, and then we had like a kind of little validation step in here just to make sure that nothing sp spooky is going on with space wizards trying to wreck our game and, and cheat and otherwise uh, yeah we move move the player to the to the new room we update the state and that's that's it I don't think this is a terrible. I mean, there's a lot going on that doesn't really matter to the game so much. If the data is loaded in and designed correctly, like the, the map, room map, and exits and all that stuff, 
and all the IDs are generated correctly and everything, that shouldn't ever happen. Uh, so it's just a little extra cautious, but uh, it's all right. I'm just a slightly worried that uh, this is all going to break out into like a very big kind of case match, so I wonder if we should split this out into like a separate function. Because if we go into pick up here, we're going to add another like tiny lines. So it's going to be here. Try to find all this stuff. So um, let's try like a walk to function. It's basically going to have the same-ish stuff, except it's going to have the exit ID already. You can take the world. Uh, exit. And in here, in the world. If I could spell properly, that would be great. Plop it in here. And don't forget our dude mutation, of course. Which we format this a little better. There we go, there we go, there we go. White space sensitivity, love it. There we go, pull it out. Looking nice, looking good. Now the only thing I think we run into with this pattern, we haven't gone very far with it yet, but when you use a sum type like this, uh, it, it really limits our, or it really like, kind of makes our set of supported commands really set in stone. And if we wanted to add other commands and sort of dynamically dispatch to other commands uh, later on and, and like make our engine kind of extensible, that would might be a problem. Um, because when you're, when you're using a sum type here, basically you're saying these are the only two possible values that could ever exist. Uh, walk and pick up are the only kinds of commands that, that exist in the whole the whole thing, right? And it probably isn't so bad if we're not building like a generic, super generic engine that we want to like reuse with different games. Um, so it's just something to look out for if you, if you kind of need that extensibility. Um, our command might need to be parameterized by the type of command of and then have something that implements dynamic dispatch for there. But that's pretty good for now. Um, so let's walk. We did walk two. Uh, we could implement pickup as well. Or we could just leave it undefined. Uh, what else could we do? We could look at this warning. We don't actually use Reform. Yeah, we only use it for its error case. Right. Oh, that's a good idea. Good pattern. <laughs> we don't bind it to anything. I don't know, it looks kind of funky, but this is like suppressing, since we're not using it, we just look it up and then throw away the result. We just want to make sure that it's actually there. Uh, what's this one here? 
redundant brackets. Thank you. Okay, and this here. Is it a redundant bracket? I don't know. I mean, in this one here. Okay, thank you. All right, cool. Look a little better. Yeah, I know we don't really use that right now. Okay, so that's our interact step. That's like our, what is it? The eval step of our read eval print loop. And then we still have the, the render part, the print part. So we need to do that. Um, render the world, show it all at once. Let's see what we can do. We can just probably call it render. The world, just render it to a string for now. Oh boy. Good thing we have the render room function. So our render function is going to be similarly stuck with this responsibility of looking things up that, again, might not be there. Um, so I'm not even sure if this design is actually going to be that great. Um, this whole identity ID thing. I don't know, maybe a different pattern will emerge for it that won't make it so bad. Um, so I've tried this before, um, building little adventure games for shits and giggles. And I put the identity, I put the, like, the actual room object say and i put the actual items in the list here of the room description and what i found when you do that is that you end up with like these really deeply nested traversals through stuff uh, which is also painful it can be ameliorated by lenses and lens magic um, but then the state updates get really annoying So like picking up an item, for example, from a room. Right, we don't have you know, the entity IDs in the room, but we can talk about those independently of the current state. Like if the, uh, like we still have to change, we still have to remove the, I guess, the items from this list, the entity IDs, I suppose. Filter them out. What was I kind of, I don't know. I was ha anyways, I was having, I was kind of annoyed with uh, with having to dig through the, across the state like that. So I wanted to experiment with this idea of using um, kind of global a global database of, of things. But maybe there's a maybe there's a way we could encapsulate all those lookups into something somewhere. Anyways, our render is going to have to do the same thing in order to call render room, right? Uh, to render the current room. Um, actually, you know what? Before I go on there, let, why don't we just clean this up a little bit? Because we can probably just pattern match out uh, world here. Get the exits. Like the other around. Uh, yeah, rooms, items, exits. So exits and This. Or we can just get the exits. And we'll get rid 
that. And we'll just get our runes. Place that with runes. I still need those little cups there. That's a little nicer. Well, we still need to pull it in. That reference there is. Just that. Okay, that cuts it down a little bit. Um, so we're going to do the same thing for render. Fortunately, we don't need to hold on to the logs and we'll be updating it. We'll just need the data out of it. Yeah, that's all we got to play with. Um, but we do, actually before we get in here, yeah. So we're gonna end up with the same sort of situation here. So, when we're rendering, uh, we only need to render what we can currently see around the player. So from the rooms, we get the room, and in fact, actually, actually render room says it all, right? Uh, we need to get a room, we need to get a list of items, and a list of exits. Then we can call render room and Bob's your uncle. So, I don't know who Bob is, but if he is your uncle, he's everybody's uncle. I just want to meet this prolific Bob. One day. So we're going to do pretty much the same pattern as before, I guess. Right? Like, you need to write, blah blah blah, room does not exist. Say a room. Look up. Player room from rooms. So we have the room. We need the list of items. So we got the list of item IDs. We just have to look those up. Um, to get it out. Oof. Let's see if we can map this one first and see what we've got down here. So we've got the, what do we know here? We know the list of rooms and the room items. And that's the list of I don't know, the entity IDs. So then we're gonna look up. So we could probably map that. Uh, look up is gonna take. This is its second argument. So we're gonna flip look up. This there might be a better way of doing this. We're gonna give look up the uh, items database. I guess is the first argument, and then it'll get the um, thing to look up as one to it. So the world, uh, sorry, items. Look up items. That'll give me a list of items. Or a list of maybe items. And the other ones, we'll just have to turn that into an actual thing. The other one was uh, exits. Um, and exits. 
And let's see if we get any powerful arrows here. <laughs> we do. So it's a maybe the Am I just not applying it properly? Yeah. It's gotta be in here. Okay. Well one one way can debug this side, we can just put a hole here. So it's a function from an entity ID of item to B. Right, so let's just pull that out. What I liked about that too is that uh, it's not the kind of type of Put a hole here. So we need a type of B, we have in scope, an entity ID, uh, item. We have a list of items. So I'm just looking at the uh, thing inside. I hopefully you can see it. I hope the font's big enough. Okay. So we have the entity ID in scope here. Well, that's the new item. Items has a list of items. So if we do look up on that with our entity ID, we should get maybe the back. Ugh. Oh, I see it, and it just wants. I think I see it anyway. It just wants the. Uh, Plain old B. Alright, because if I do this, I'm going to look up. This is what I was hoping the flip was doing. This wouldn't be entity ID, this would be item ID. Let's just rename it so it makes sense. And then items. list of EVDs, but maybe Ugh. Maybe we can just case split it out. And if in the case of nothing, we have to return to B. Right? Yeah. So maybe map isn't exactly the greatest thing that we want here. What's wrong with the navy bees? Maybe that's what I want.
it's not happy with me because of the type solution. I'm just going to turn that on ter just temporarily. I was asking for me for uh, scope type degrees. Well, scope type variables isn't so bad, but I just hate those kind of like ugly. Help that, uh, yeah. Too much shadow on that. So maybe I don't actually do that. Hey, yo. Okay. Revealed my problem there. You probably saw it sitting there at home. It happens. Back to where we were. So I have a list of maybe items now. Uh, we could be cheesy here <laughs> and ignore the errors. <laughs> um, which I think Koenig would be very disappointed in us if we did that. That might be a little bit disappointing to me if I did that. Right? Because if. That would suggest that, like, somehow, some way, it shouldn't happen. But the world state is in a bad place. That's what it means, I think. So. That's that. Should we ignore if any of them come up, maybe? I, how could we even... Uh, how could we even turn this into a situation where we fail early on this lookup? So what I have is a list Maybe ace. And I want to go to either game error or uh, stream. And in fact, if any of those A's, if any of these are nothing. should just go right to arrow out early. Now, I think there's a function for that. Um, it might either be sequence, it's either sequence or traverse. <laughs> it's almost always traverse. So yeah, let's just uh, look up the type of traverse in the sequence. Alright. Alright, so sequence, if our M here is uh, let's see. So we evaluate each monadic action in the structure from left to right and collect the results for a version that ignores the results. See sequence underscore. Right. Hmm. This 
That's not quite right because the M's would have to be the same. Traverse. Map each element of the structure to an action. Evaluate these actions left to right and collect the results. So it takes an A, some value in our traversing our structure. Right. So if our A is a list, so if our T of A is a list of maybes, we could just pattern match here on the nothings. We would return the left error, and on the right we return the object, and then we get the thing. So I think traverse is the winner. Let's give it a shot. So we've got our list already. Traverse something. to import traverse. <laughs> what do you mean it's not in the prelude? Come on. Come on. Yeah. Yeah, it's gotta be in prelude. What, what am I seeing here? Maybe I'm jumping to conclusions again. Traverse isn't there, it's uh, a. <laughs> uh, I can't find the applicative instance. It doesn't know what we're, uh, we're feeding it here, so. Hang on, we'll fix that in a second. Let's get back to Traverse here. So our function is going to be in the first position. That's what the hole we gave it for. Uh, a T of A's. Okay, so it's going to be a traversable list. I thought list is traversable. Is that the problem? If we, well, if we ignore that one for now, our hole should be of type maybe item to something of B. So maybe if we fill in the hole, we'll be able to So let's just pull that out. Uh, we could do that with a lambda case. Okay. 
So we need to traverse earlier, I think. Let's put that there. Uh, and then the list of things is the items. hole here we get the tuple of entity ID item so we get the the entity ID we need uh, and the item well this is the whole database we don't traverse over the whole database no, no, no. Uh, just the rooms items This should just be a list of, yeah. Okay, so this holds, right? That, that's an entity ID thing. So in, in this function, we should be able to do the lookup um, and all that, all that junk. Oh, oh hello, friends. Uh, looks like maybe we just got raided, possibly, again. So welcome if you are uh, if there is a raid going on. I just see it in my activity feed here. Hey Corruptical, Corruptical, nice to see you again. Welcome, welcome back. Right on. So we're just uh, messing around, chilling, making a little text adventure. Kurdiver, hopefully I said that. Thanks for the follow. Much appreciated. So normally I'm, I've been building a, a key value database in Haskell from scratch. Uh, today, just, this week I decided just for funsies, let's just mix it up. Uh, we'll, make a, we'll make a text adventure game in Haskell. It's quick and easy, it's fun. And also helps me kind of demonstrate some cool ideas and little Haskell mini patterns. Um, I got the idea from this blog post here. So check it out. Um, we've been trying to keep up with using some phantom types and using monad fail and the do notation and all that kind of stuff. So check it out. It's a good, uh, good little, little blog post. And right now I'm just trying to pull in the list of items from our room using our good old friend traverse. So we have to do some lookups along the way. I need to spend more time with Traverse or with Koinik or the blog post because it's a good one. And, um, right. Right. So in this hole, we have to return something that's inapplicable, which are basically going to return the arm either. Yes. I know, I, I pull on that joke too. It's always traverse. I'm like, I don't know if it always is, but I guess. Uh, I think, we're just trying it out. I think in this case it might be a traverse. Yeah, that's a good blog post. Definitely, definitely check it out. In fact, I kind of wish it was like a, almost, I almost kind of wish it was a living document, but uh, I can see how it'd be hard to do because they have little slow, show solution boxes and stuff. It's really well put together. But it'd be kind of cool if we had it. We were able to add more to this over time. Hopefully, they will. Um, yeah. So we have the item ID here in this little function. Uh, we have to return basically an either, either the gamer or the item. And that way, when we're done traversing, we'll have a list of items. Or if we encounter and they're looking up an item out of the world database at any point in time, and then we just fit right away. We don't have to worry about it too much. Yeah, I am too. I'm actually running a little overtime this week, so 
Thanks for stopping by. Thanks for the raid and the follows. And I'll hopefully see you again soon. May your monads always be free and your types be always check. Amen, Lambda. Something, I don't know. Um, where was I? <laughs> I was looking up stuff. I was looking stuff up in the database, that's right. Uh, I was looking up stuff here. It's very really unique. Kind of goes super nasty right now. Uh, look up the item ID, the items database. And, ugh, I'm gonna pull this out in a separate function. So it's just gonna get dirty and hard to follow. We'll call it get item. The item ID, and the items to get it from. So here, uh, we're gonna look up, do the lookup, and the pattern match. Uh, look up item ID and items. And if we have it, if we have nothing, then at least we can return our error case. This time we got a little bit stuck before because we didn't have the item ID and scope, but now we do, so that's a good thing. In the case of nothing, we just return left. Um, item does not exist and the item ID. Otherwise, we do have the item, and let's return that. I'll write of that, though. Uh, yeah. See you later, B bitch. I'm just gonna try and wrap up this little, little section here, and then I might uh, pop off too. <laughs> Um, but I'm just super pumped right now. I'm having a lot of fun, so I'm just going to finish this off a little bit. Because we also got to see Traverse here as well, so I'm excited about that. Um, so get rid of that as sort of part of that anyway. Traverse with get um, exit. And again, we're getting a bit of repeatish code here. Looks like we could probably use a little more genericization. Polymorphization, I think they called it in the blog post. We'll see. We'll see. Um, so the exit ID the exits. Uh, exits of reason being that we're gonna this is gonna look exactly almost exactly the same we're just gonna change the uh, error type here otherwise we have an exit and we'll return that exit bam Okay, cool. Look at this, look at this. Okay. What? Okay, let's not uh, count our eggs before we hatched, is the saying. Uh, this isn't quite the type I was expecting for Exits Prime and Items Prime. Uh, it's still a function type. So, does that mean, well, so I'll just feed it in the rooms here. Okay. 
Oh, sorry. Uh, not one of those items. That's a good type there to have. Thank you. So items prime now is a list of either game error or item. It's not what I was going for. Does it work better if I do it like this? Sense. Or either. this and we got a function of the HDID item a list uh, that's pretty informative I think I understand what's going on there. Hmm. Are we expected to pass in items? But... Hopefully we can we, do we have the items in scope down here? I guess we do. Okay. Yeah, that's better. That's what I was expecting there. Okay. Yeah, items prime should be a list of items. Uh, at the whole. Alright, so traverse is gonna return our um, an either type with the right being the list of things it's collected, it's traversed over, or the left will be our the error that we return. Um, so yeah, this was a nice use of traverse. I just didn't get quite right because of the let binding. That's okay. Um, let's just fix up exits as well. Get exits doesn't take exits as a parameter. Um, super duper. Okay, cool. Now we have the list of exits, the list of items, and a room in scope, which means we should be able to render the room. Yeah, so Curdver, you're asking, is there a particular reason why I'm using Traverse here? And I'm using it in this render function here uh, because of the way we kind of structure this uh, world. So I'll show you the types and maybe it'll make more sense. Um, so when I'm looking at a room and all the, room, the items in the room, uh, instead of storing like values of items themselves and we're kind of shuffling that value all over the place as we manipulate the game, we just restore a reference to the item, an, entity, an ID. And the idea is that 
the world itself holds the entire database of all the items that are in there. Okay. And when you go to look up an item with an ID, of course, it might not be in our map. It just might not be there. So we could do this where we um, walk through uh, all these items and look them up. And uh, is it exist? Da da da. No. Yes. Um, instead, I just kind of want to be able to get all the items out of the room and do the lookup. And if one of those lookups fails, then we just return a game error, which is that the item doesn't exist. For example, what we're traversing this. And so we're kind of use, we're kind of exploiting the fact that monad fail um, plays a part plays a role in in do in desugaring do. So if this traverse ends up on a left of our game error, item does not exist. If this gets returned by our traverse at any point in time when we're looking up the item, then uh, the whole computation will return that that error. Now, in theory, that shouldn't happen. Right? When we're constructing and building our game, for example, we're loading our game assets and we're loading in the database of items and rooms and things like that. Uh, hopefully, we get that all correct. But it's still a possibility, so this code still has to handle it somehow. And uh, I think that handles it nice and flat and easily. We kind of just find it in there and keep going as if items exist in this in a list of items. We don't have to worry about the failure case. It'll get handled for us. Does that answer your question? Yeah? Good. Cool, cool. So let's just clean this up. Um, oh, ooh, I have an existing binding. Oh yeah, because I have a top level binding for me. I'll just call that uh, default. Instead. Make that go away. Uh, items. Where's that one? Oh, okay, sure. No more errors. We're good to go. So there's kind of our global world render function uh, built up from smaller parts. You're welcome, Gruber. I like getting questions and uh, being able to answer them. And I think that's, uh, yeah, so we get the render in Mach 2. Uh, if I had a little bit more juice in me and it wasn't so late, I would say let's start hooking up the, uh, the REPL, the loop. Uh, and then maybe get the read part going, but uh, we'll have to we'll have to wait till another time. To come back to this. But that's that for tonight, friends. We learned a little bit about traverse. Uh, we learned a little bit about using phantom types, so our entity IDs, which kind of made our code a little bit readable, more readable. And now, when we're doing lookups and stuff, uh, we can do lookups on entity IDs of rooms, entity IDs of items. Can't mix those up. If we have functions later on that interact with our state, um, like our commands here, they can only talk about certain kinds of entity IDs, uh, which is great. Uh, with render room, we kept that nice and pure. We kind of had a bit of a debate about, um, about this, whether it should bifurcate and like, we should just give it a room, a world. Um, but we push that onto a caller, which is going to be this render function. And so this, this caller is going to be responsible for doing all those lookups, which made calling render room nice. So we built up to that. Uh, having an interaction with this pattern here with our world command to either game or world. Um, I'm noticing like we still have to handle all of these cases where things don't exist in the database. So. Uh, hopefully a better pattern will emerge for that to make these lookups a little, um, a little nicer. But uh, it's not too bad having them contained in one place anyway. Uh, 
And uh, yeah, so we learned a little bit of the monad fail pattern as well. Uh, so if any of these lookups fail, in the left case, it just trivially returns the game error. We don't have to really handle it at each step. And yeah, text adventures, they're fun to program. So if you've never done it before, uh, give it a shot. See what you come up with. I'd love to hear about it too. You can catch me on the FP chat Slack. Um, that's, uh, I think I had it pulled up here. That's this little fun fun group here. Functional programming Slack. I'm also on the Zulip. There's a functional programming Zulip, which I think is kind of cool too. Um, Zulip is kind of like Slack, but instead of the threads kind of being ephemeral, they lock down a topic so you can come back and visit a topic anytime. And we publish those back out to the web too. So Zulip's a pretty cool server to be on. And if you want to share your project with me, um, you can find me on there, or you can just tweet at me. I'm Ag Agent Ultra on the Twitters. And uh, maybe I'll get this code pushed up somewhere and, and tweet that out later. So if you want to find that code, I'll uh, make sure to link it. And if once it gets to YouTube, I'll, I'll link it in the description as well. Thanks a lot for following along and happy Haskell hacking. And we'll, uh, we'll see you next week.